Hello, my name is Michael Higgs and I am the manager of the Keeve Hill Heritage Foundation, an affiliate of Keeve Hill Cemetery, which is a 168-year-old Victorian-era garden-style cemetery located in Louisville, Kentucky. Today I am glad to bring you a presentation entitled The Basics of Cemetery Preservation. Next slide. During our discussion today, we will be focusing on several different talking points. Those will include burial grounds and the different types of burial grounds that one might encounter, as well as surveying burying grounds. Also, monument styles, monument conservation and repair, cemetery fences, the identification and repair of those, interpreting symbols, dispositional authority, and finally, record keeping. During our presentation, we will be looking at several videos from nationally reputable organizations that will provide a greater level of understanding, uh, but we will get to those shortly. Next slide. The first question that we're going to entertain is what type of burial grounds exist? How are they different? Next slide. The first type of burying ground that one might encounter is a graveyard. Often this is a very heavily confused term as most people equate it with a cemetery. A cemetery is not a graveyard and a graveyard is not a cemetery. The term graveyard has always been synonymous with a church, typically a church yard that just happens to be purposed for the use of graves, therefore graveyard. Next slide. The next type of uh, burying ground that one might encounter is a city owned and or municipal cemetery. This type of cemetery is owned by a company, an incorporated town, uh, by some city entity, but often there is a challenge with working in this environment because there may not be a full commitment of funding. Often other city services are prioritized over cemetery use and development and therefore that poses some challenges to maintaining city owned and or municipal burying grounds. Next slide. The next type of burying ground that one might encounter is a family cemetery. Family cemeteries are very popular still today in rural communities as well as in agricultural communities, for example, uh, such as far eastern Kentucky and or southern Kentucky, where families tend to use their own ground that they have purchased, their own farmland, to bury their families. It will often yield a great amount of research out of family cemeteries because you have consecutive generations represented in a small geographic area. Next slide. The next type of cemetery that one might encounter is a private cemetery. A good example of a private cemetery is Cave Hill Cemetery located in Louisville, Kentucky. The cemetery company owns the land, but when an individual purchases the right to be buried there, they're called a lot holder. They have a certain easement right of burial, but they do not own the land. They cannot be taxed for owning a burial right. It is an easement right. The cemetery company maintains the rules and regulations and order within the cemetery. Next slide. The next question that we will entertain is how to survey a cemetery. Where do I begin? What do I need? What can I do? Next slide. Here are some basic tips for conducting a cemetery survey. Make sure that you have or do the following before you begin. Make sure that you have a digital camera and that you have your flash card within the camera first and foremost and that it is charged. You'll need a pen, a cemetery survey form and or grid paper, rubbing paper and an instrument to use the rubbing paper, a compass, or most people these days simply use their smartphone and a compass that's built in through an app, a measuring tape or ruler, 
and maybe an aerial map. Next slide. As you can see in the aerial map that is presented, uh, this is a bit of farmland and this just so happens to be my father-in-law's property in far east Kentucky. If you look closely as you're trying to figure out where a cemetery could be located in an agricultural and or rural area, it may help to look at an aerial map of the surrounding property first. As you can see where the arrow is pointing, there is a headstone there and that would tell me exactly where I needed to go on the property to find the cemetery, assuming that I had the property owner's permission first, of course. Next slide. Here's an example of a cemetery census or cemetery survey form. Here are some basic things that are always good to record, such as the name of the cemetery and or any other alternative names that may exist. You can often find that out by simply asking people in the region. Also the location of the cemetery. Make sure you try to include GPS coordinates if possible. It's more exact in that way. Directions to the cemetery. Other facts about the cemetery that you've encountered along the way. And then at the bottom of the form there's a listing for name, birth date, death date, a picture reference, and any additional notes. What that is for is to denote the exact recording of each and every marker and or monument in the cemetery. Make sure that you keep them in order and that you keep your pictures in order as they would be written on the form. Next slide. When you're conducting a cemetery survey, here are some basic tips and suggestions. During the survey, you want to inspect the surrounding area carefully. Look for boundary markers, possibly large trees, corner posts, shrubs, rocks, or anything of the sort. Uh, walls, anything that you can see, or remnants of walls. Take a photograph of the overall layout first, then take a photograph and measure each and every marker and or monument on the cemetery. Then document the photo sequence on the cemetery census form as I indicated earlier. Next slide. Additional tips and suggestions include note the name, inscriptions, under and or any other presenting information on the markers and or monuments. You may also want to sketch the layout of the cemetery. Make sure that the graves are noted in order. It's further suggested that you begin on the southwest corner and move to the northeast. Work in a grid pattern also. This will help you keep things organized. The reason that it is suggested that individuals begin at the southwest corner or move to the northeast is that often if you're looking at a larger property where a very prominent family owned the property and they had a servant or a butler and or a slave, uh, the burying ground for those individuals was often separate from the primary family burying ground. Therefore that might give you more information that you can yield as you're charting out lineage. Next slide. Normally markers are placed at the center of a grave. Grave markers are typically at the head of a grave as well. To give you an example, Cavefield Cemetery grave dimensions are for a traditional casket space 33 inches by 90 inches. A cremation grave that is prepared today is 20 inches by 20 inches. A good suggestion is to always plan for the unplanned finding. Also check with existing historical surveys or documents as a backup. Next slide. The most important thing that you could ever do is to share your information with local and or state resources. For example, the Kentucky Historical Society maintains a great database of cemeteries across the Commonwealth and they are always welcome to receive information from individuals that are doing research out in the field. Next slide. Here's some websites that you might want to 
utilize and share information or you could yield information before you do your work out in the field. That's the Kentucky Historical Society Research and Collections website. Also the Kentucky Historical Society Cemetery Preservation Information website. And there are different county historical societies that may be of use to you. A very good historical society that you can always reference if you're in Northern Kentucky is the Kenton County Historical Society. Next slide. So what kinds of memorials might you find as you're working through a cemetery survey? The most common types of memorials that you might encounter are a headstone, which is simply a piece of granite that is upright, that is placed in a, a cutout slot in the ground, a die and a socket. The die is the upright portion of the granite. There is a base that, it, that is then affixed to, and that is a die and a socket. You have a die on a base, and also a raised top marker or what in the industry one might even call a beveled marker. It typically has a pitched elevation so you can read it from the roadway. Next slide. Additional types of markers and or memorials that you might encounter include a government marker, albeit a cemetery mar marker, typical government marker that is, or a Civil War type marker a lawn level marker which could be made of granite and or bronze, a footstone, or a plaque marker, or as those in the cemetery and or funeral industry would call it, a slant marker. Next slide. You might also encounter a pulpit marker, a die base and cap marker, a little more complicated than a die on a base because it has more a more decorative top to it. A bedstead, which was very common during the Victorian era, as well as a tabletop tomb. You could also encounter obelisks, a pedestal tomb, a box tomb, or even a ledger. Ledgers typically provide a great deal of information because families have more surface to engrave on. Therefore, if you find one, try to make sure to wash it off very well. That way you can get as much information as possible for your records. Next slide. So what are the most common marker or monument mediums that will be found in cemeteries? Next slide. You might find wooden plaques. Often families could not afford a granite and or marble marker or zinc marker or any other type of material. So they would use about anything they could find on the property to help memorialize their loved one. That included wood and some families still do that. So simply don't walk through a cemetery and discard a piece of wood as being just a piece of debris it could be a grave marker. Next slide. Stones are also used for memorialization. So another good tip as well is to not walk through the cemetery and kick stones about because you could be moving a grave marker off of a grave and not even realize it. Pay close attention to the rocks that you see. They could be good delineating measures to see where you are and also where graves could be located. Next slide. An additional type of medium that you might encounter is concrete. This is still very commonly used today, especially in family cemeteries. It's cheap and it's easy to engrave and it's fairly permanent as well. You can also provide coloring in the letters so that they stand out from a distance and it makes for an easy memorial that someone in the family could prepare. Next slide. Another type of medium that you might encounter is zinc. Often as you're walking through an old cemetery, if you see a bluish hint of color on a marker, it likely is made of zinc. 
uh, the markers are hollow and because of oxidization and chemical reactions with exposure to water and or wind or other atmospheric elements the medium will turn blue. Next slide. Another common type of medium that you might encounter is marble. Uh, many older cemeteries have a prolific amount of marble within them. Marble was very easily come by in the Victorian era and also, and it still is today, mind you, however, the medium is also very easy to manipulate. So you can produce intricate carvings and you can do quite a bit of work in marble. The bad side to that is that it is very much susceptible to atmospheric damage. Acid rain eats away marble at a faster rate than granite and it also collects a great deal of pollution in the atmosphere so what was once a white piece of marble after advanced years will often turn black. Next slide. Another type of medium that you might encounter is granite. Granite is a very durable surface. It does not erode as fast as marble and you can still produce very intricate carvings in marble but the good side to this is that it will last for a long time. It is a little more expensive in some cases and it does give you more flexibility with a range of colors that you can choose from when designing your family memorial. Most individuals do not realize that granite does not simply come from the United States. Most cemeteries and or monument companies import granite from around the world, from South Africa to South America, to Mexico, to China. Granite comes from around the world and in different colors depending on the region. Next slide. Another type of medium that you might encounter is limestone. Limestone was very commonly used in the Victorian era and just after that and limestone is also susceptible to quite a bit of damage uh, damage due to atmospheric conditions through acid rain and pollution. It is actually much softer than marble. Next slide. Slate is another type of medium that you might encounter. If you're walking through an old cemetery and you see markers and monuments that look black in color, that's often indicative that it is made out of slate also very susceptible to damage in the atmosphere. Next slide. Soapstone is another type of medium that you might encounter. Soapstone is the most susceptible, I would say, to damage due to acid rain and pollution because it is a very, very a non, if you will, a very non a dense material. Uh, it is softer than slate, it is softer than marble and limestone. It is easy to manipulate as far as carving and engraving is concerned, which makes it much more susceptible to damage. Next slide. Bronze is another type of medium that you might encounter. Many families these days are using bronze to provide very intricately designed memorials for their families, some of which include the addition of photographs on bronze or even bronze statues in cemeteries or your typical flush bronze marker uh, that you might see for a veteran or for a private family. Next slide. Something that you cannot forget about when you're trying to locate a cemetery or figure out where graves are located is the fact that some individuals did not use markers as we see them today. They used plants and or shrubs as their memorial. So as you're going through an area, an open field, and you see shrubs aligned in a certain fashion or other plants, yucca plants for example, 
or other types of uh, plant material arranged in a very odd way that could be indicative that a cemetery is located in that area. So pay close attention to plant and shrub orientation. Next slide. So how do I properly clean a memorial? Next slide. Here are some suggested products for cleaning markers and monuments. These come from my personal experience and I am aware that they do work. So I would highly suggest that you look at a product that is called Orvis. It's Orvis WA paste or in other words Orvis horse soap. It is used for cleaning horses but it works wonders on memorials. Also Kodak Photo Flow and any biocide such as D2 or something along those lines will make a drastic difference in the appearance of a marker and or monument as you're trying to restore it. The key thing as Eric Church reminded us is that you must have water. Water is a critical thing to have as you're doing work in the field to keep markers and monuments clean and also to rinse off the agents that are being used for the cleaning process. Next slide. Useful tools and tips for monument cleaning include do not use wire brushes. Always use a soft bristle brush. Key thing is water, water and more water. When applying cleaning agents, start at the bottom and work your way up. This avoids streaking. Do not use high pressure sprayers. Do not use bleach or other abrasives. And do not use crayons or paint to fill in letters to help you read a surface area. Next slide. So what if you run across a monument and or marker in the field that is broken? How can I repair a broken monument? Next slide. So here's some basic information uh, that will help you if you are essentially repairing broken monuments and markers. Some key things to do in the process are to uh, make sure that you have all of the broken pieces of the marker and or monument assembled in one area. Make sure that you have a soft bristle brush, a wire brush strictly for cleaning a surface that will be um, attached with epoxy. Make sure that you have plenty of water, marble dust. You can get different color pigments from companies such as Granite City Tool or you can even if you have a small piece of material that you know you cannot use you can take a wire brush and brush uh, some pigment off of that and create dust that way. Uh, you'll also need buckets. You also need epoxy, two-part resin, and hardener pack. Uh, the clear brand is what we recommend from the Akimi company and once again that can be purchased from in a company such as Granite City Tool. You might also need a sanding block. Next slide. Make sure that you have all the affected marble pieces together. Ensure that the affected area on the marker and or monument is clean of debris. Brush away debris as necessary. From there you'll need to mix the epoxy and marble dust. Then apply the epoxy and marble dust mix to the hardener and resin mix. Then apply mixture to the broken pieces. Set the broken pieces in position sand away any excess mixture that has emerged during the setting process and finally clean the monument and or marker with water and a soft bristle brush. Next step, our slide. So what are the common types of fencing that you might encounter as you're out working in cemeteries? Often a cemetery fence can give you a clue to a person's heritage or background or even to the prominence. Next slide. Different types of fencing that one might encounter in cemeteries include a hairpin fence, a hairpin and picket fence, 
and also a bow in picket fence. Next slide. Additional types of fencing might include a milled point, woven wire, or even gas pipe railing type fence. Next slide. What can I do to preserve cemetery fencing? That's a key thing if you're trying to fully restore an area. Key is look for signage or engraving on the fencing that indicates the manufacturer's name. Some materials that you might need include a camera, data sheet, any appropriate tools that are necessary for restoring an iron fence, which would include possibly a rust converter, primer, and paint, and many brushes. Next slide. Often when you're working in cemeteries and you're documenting resources, you will find that monuments will include different types of symbols. There could be an angel, there could be a column that is cut short or broken uh, in, in appearance. So what do all of these symbols mean? Next slide. Here are some common interpretations for monuments that you might find in cemeteries. For example, a broken column often means that a life was cut too short. A crown is the crown of life. An upside down torch is symbolic of a life extinguished. A lion often indicates strength and flowers are very typical funerary symbol. Next slide. Here are some additional symbols. You can see the A and O encompassed there. That's the Alpha and Omega. You can see the angelic representations, a gateway or arch to heaven. You see the upside down torch. Uh, you'll often see a ship sailing. That's a ship sailing to paradise or a ship sailing to heaven. Uh, then sometimes families become very confused when they see what looks like a dollar sign engraved in the center of a cross or simply engraved on a monumental surface. That does not mean that an individual was rich or was very prominent. It simply means Christ. Next slide. Here's a mausoleum in Cave Hill Cemetery that has quite a few different symbols presenting on uh, the exterior surface. For example, there are gargoyles at the top of the building, as well as lion's heads. There are flowers around the door of the mausoleum. The family coat of arms is at the center front of the building. And there are owls on each side of the building. The uh, gargoyles ward off evil spirits, while the uh, lion's heads indicate strength and the owl stands for watchfulness. This family was very much involved in river faring and that often lent itself to quite a bit of skepticism, quite a bit of uh, worry about things and it was not uncommon to see this severity of inclusion of symbols to ward off evil spirits uh, because of that uh, family background. Next slide. Here's some close-ups of the different uh, symbols on the mausoleum. You can see the flowers as well as the owl with very large eyes, I might add, as well as the family coat of arms, lion's heads, and also the gargoyle. Next slide. So who can be buried in my cemetery lot? Now, let me add a caveat here in that I'm going to address this from Kentucky law. Each state is different. Each cemetery maintains their own rules and regulations. So let me add that caveat very clearly. This is a strictly Kentucky-oriented, private cemetery-oriented representation of who can be buried in my cemetery lot. Next slide. 
Dispositional authority. Here are some key things to remember. Each cemetery is different with regard to rules and regulations and policies and procedures. Those are key things that you must understand when trying to determine who has a right of burial or not. Always check with your cemetery. In most cemeteries in Kentucky, for example, follow something called the Law of Descent. It's a descent from a lot, or the lot holder, under KRS Statute 391.010. Next slide. This is a summarization of the succession of burial rights from the Law of Descent. This is how we interpret this at Cave Hill Cemetery, as well as many other cemeteries in the Commonwealth. You have the lot holder, who is the original purchaser. The spouse of the lot holder has an innate inherent right of burial. Then the right of burial is inherited by the lineal descendants, meaning the children of the lot holder in order of need without the consent of others claiming interest subject to remaining spaces. If there are no lineal descendants, then we look to heirs at law. That will include parents of the lot holder and their spouse and children. Therefore that adds in aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, but those individuals would only have a right of burial if it is clearly indicated by the owner before they pass away or after they pass away if there are no lineal descendants then only that generation in the family tree could have a right of burial on a family cemetery lot. Next slide. So what kind of information can I find at my local cemetery? Next slide. Record keeping. Accuracy is critical in cemeteries. For example, we have always prided ourselves at Cave Hill Cemetery with maintaining very accurate records. We know where every burial is located. We have very precise measurements to locate each and every grave within the 296 acres that make up Cave Hill. And hopefully your cemetery that you're working in will have the same type of information or at least some reasonable facsimile of that. It's always good business practice to collect as much information as possible. However, we do have to be very cautious in providing information to the public due to privacy laws. Cemeteries will likely have the following information, such as obituaries, date of birth, date of death, date of burial, limited lineage information, that is, if there are affidavits on file, or you can even Return, or uh, retrieve the information from obituaries, the name of the funeral home, as well as obviously the grave location. Thank you very much for your participation and attendance and listening to the presentation on the basics of cemetery preservation. If you need assist, uh, additional information, you are welcome to contact my office at Cave Hill Cemetery at 502-451-5630. You can also visit our website at www.cavehillcemetery.com or www.cavehillheritagefoundation.org. This is Michael Higgs and it has been my pleasure to speak with you today.